And today, we're going to see that Jesus, by coming, brings the presence of God to us. He has come to betroth us to himself so that we can live in his house forever. This brought about a huge change in history by which we date our calendars. Anno Domini, the year of the Lord, 2019. By coming among us, he ushered in a new age of fulfillment and he replaced the Old Testament dispensation of promise. Okay, so today by preaching to you, I desire to connect you to him as the one who has come. Not that I do that, but the word of God preached, Holy Spirit working, connects you to the living of God, living God. We're connected by faith. And faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. This is really what biblical preachers are always aiming to do, to connect people with Christ by living faith. And that's especially my aim today, because that's what our text talks about. The very fact that Jesus came to us, something that a lot of people missed. You only connect with him through preaching when God's spirit opens your heart to receive the word with faith. And even when Jesus comes in the flesh, people only connect with him when the spirit opens their heart and they receive him by faith. And we're going to see that. Let me say to you that once you believe, it is an ongoing experience as well. Our connection with Christ is enriched as we go on. We learn more of him and we walk more with him in living communion. Not just knowing about him, but walking with him. So listen as I read today's text to you. It's from Mark 2, 18 through 22. This is the word of God. May it powerfully work in you, even as you hear it read and preached to you, that you may connect with Jesus Christ and connect more fully with him. Mark 2, 18. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. Then they came and said to him, Why do you, the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, or else the new piece pulls away from the old, and the tear is made worse. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. And there we end the reading of God's holy and infallible word. The word that connects you to the living Savior. Now you can see from this text that many people in the church were out of touch with God when Jesus came. Okay, they, they weren't cognizant of what was going on. The disciples of the Pharisees and the disciples of John certainly were in that category. These two groups were both praying and fasting. For what? Especially, what was the essence of their... That the Messiah would come. The Pharisees, I mentioned to you a bit about them last week. They were a movement within Judaism that had sprung up when the Greeks tried to force the Jews to embrace Greek culture. The Greeks were the dominant world power, and when you're the dominant world power, you think that everyone should want to be like you. <laughs> you guys all need to come and be Greeks, and you need to look at life the way we look at it, because we're the, we're the important people, because we have dominion over everyone. You need to acknowledge how, how wonderful we are, because we're in charge. That's the, kind of the way it goes. But the Jewish religion was in the way. <laughs> it had the food laws that didn't fit with Greek culture, and it had its... Uh, Confession that there was only one God, and that didn't fit very well either. And its view that salvation was of the Jews, that certainly didn't fit well. And uh, that the Messiah was going to come as he had been promised, that didn't fit well either. So the Pharisees arose out of those, those godly and pious Jews, many of them possessing true saving faith, 
who were living in hope of God's promises. That was how this movement arose. They were not so impressed with the Greek culture because they were impressed with the promises of God in the city whose builder and maker is God, that God had promised to them. They were looking for the promise of redemption, of deliverance from Satan and from the curse. And so the Pharisees were among those who stood up and led the other Jews to stand up against the Greeks as they tried to force Jews to dispense with their religion. God used the Pharisees in those early days in a mighty way. They were around for about 200 years before we meet them in the time of Jesus. Not quite that, but getting close to that. They were very zealous, and they, along with a lot of other Jews, prayed earnestly for God's promises to be fulfilled. That he would visit them, and that he would pour out his spirit on them. And that he would reveal his glory and renew them in righteousness. And that he would speak his truth to them. And that he would reform their worship and deliver them. Above all, they prayed that the Messiah would come. Because that was the great hope of Israel, the desire of all nations, that he would come. They joined with their prayers, fasting. Even setting aside, they came to do this regularly, Monday and Thursday, his fast days, the second and fifth day of the week. The Pharisees, along with the other earnest Jews, had been doing this for almost 200 years when, when Jesus came. And then there were John's disciples. What do we know about them? Well, John, of course, John is talking about John the Baptist, not the one that wrote the gospel, but John the Baptist. And uh, he was in the wilderness, the voice crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. He had promised that the one who was coming would not only baptize with water, which is what, what John did, but that he would baptize with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he was the one that would actually accomplish and affect the cleansing that was represented by the ordinance of baptism. His whole purpose was to prepare, John's whole purpose was to prepare the way of the coming one. So what does that mean about his disciples? Their whole reason to be was because Messiah was at hand. He was coming. He was here. And John was preparing them to welcome and to receive him. Like many other Jews, they were fasting and praying that he would come. They likely even joined those fast days that the others were, were fasting on. And John was saying that the time had come. And he even pointed to Jesus as the coming one and said, that he must increase, Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease, I'm going to be phasing out, because the one that I'm telling you about, the one that all the focus is on, the, the, the desire of ages, he is coming. He called him, even pointed to him, and said, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. I think he said with that, by prophecy, more than he even fully understood at that time. Of all people, the disciples of John, though, should have seen that he was there, that he came. And if they had obeyed John, they would have actually ceased to be these little groups of disciples of John. And John was, went off the scene and he was in prison. They would have become disciples of Christ. Well, he did. Um, Peter, James, Andrew, and John, they've been disciples of John. And then they became disciples of Christ. But the Pharisees and the disciples of John... You see, these two groups, they should have recognized that their fasting and prayers had been answered. That the Messiah was here. Here was this man that John had pointed to, and at whose baptism a voice from heaven had declared that he was the Son of God, whom God was well pleased, and a visible representation of the Holy Spirit had come down upon him, showing that he was the anointed one, that's the Christ, he was anointed with the very Holy Spirit of God. And not only that, but this man, this, this Messiah, was, was going around preaching like no man had ever preached, with authority with which no man had ever spoken, and with a claim that he was much more than a mere man, the way he spoke and the way he acted. He'd been casting out demons in his own name, forgiving sins in his own name, and they'd noticed this, healing the sick, cleansing lepers, and above all, he'd been preaching that with the kingdom of God had come, that with him that the kingdom of God had come. Because he was here, the kingdom was here. 
And the people needed to follow him and trust in him, repent of their sins, and come and follow him and obey him and, and trust in him. This, this was uh, clearly claims that no ordinary man could make. He preached that the kingdom was here and that they should believe the gospel. Good news. But the Pharisees and the disciples of John, you see, they should have been celebrating that their prayers had been answered. But they were just going right on praying like nothing had happened. Just, just like it was all the same. They, they, they come to question Jesus. Why are your disciples not fasting with us? Now, this is quite a question. Verse 18. Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? As you can tell, that's one of those questions that has a barb in it. <laughs> you know, they're not just curious. They're, they're saying, you know, what's wrong with you guys? You, you guys are inferior. Like, we fast. You, should, you guys, you're not participating. You need to, to get with the program. It's even likely here in all of the synoptic gospels, the three synoptic gospels, you have this right after the feast with Matthew. And so a lot of people have supposed that... Uh, when he was feasting with Matthew, that it was even a greater offense. Not only was he feasting with, with tax collectors and sinners, but he was doing it on one of the fast days. And, you know, Jesus is having a feast, and everybody else is fasting, and they come and say, hey, what, what's the deal? Why are your disciples feasting when everybody's fasting? Don't you guys care about the kingdom of God? What's wrong with you? <laughs> you guys are kind of inferior. They entirely missed the point. Jesus had not led his disciples to fast because he, the Messiah, had come. Hope of Israel is here. So why would you pray for the hope of Israel to come? The desire of nations had come. So why fast that he would come? It was a day of feasting and praise, not of fasting and prayer. Jesus makes it clear that the reason his disciples are not fasting is because he's here. Look at verse 19. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. And Jesus presents himself here as a bridegroom. The designation bridegroom was never used to refer to the Messiah in the Old Testament. And it was rarely used in other Jewish writings. So there have been a few references that have where it's been used in a way. God was sometimes spoken of, though. God himself, the, the triune God, the uh, Father even, as well, was spoken of as the husband of Israel. So if anything, this is even a stronger claim than Messiahship, that he is the Son of God. It shows that Jesus is the Son of God. And as we've seen at this time, Jesus avoided making it known that he was the Christ or the Messiah deliberately because there was so much misunderstanding about the Messiah. They didn't even think the Messiah would ever die. And Jesus had come to die. The reason they thought that is because it said that he would reign forever on David's throne, which he does, but he does because he's raised up. Not because he had to die for our sins and then be raised up. That's why they were so, it was such a, a hard thing for them that, okay, you're Messiah, but you're dying. That, that's not supposed to go together. The bridegroom, the bridegroom uh, imagery, using describing him as the bridegroom, becomes a very wonderful description of him in the New Covenant. Okay? As bridegroom, he came to make arrangements to take his bride as his wife and to bring her into his father's house. That's what he did when he was here. He's making the arrangements. He had to pay all of her debts. And she had a lot. A whole lot of debts. And he had to pay them by going to the cross. A debt of sin that excluded her from his father's house forever. Talking about God the Father, of course. God would not have guilty sinners in his house with his sin debt not satisfied. And the only way to rectify the wrong was for Jesus to suffer the pains of hell or for them to suffer the pains of hell. For Jesus to, and, and they would, for them, it would be forever so they would never come to the Father's house. For Jesus, 
is the Son of God. He suffered the pains of hell on the cross. The full penalty of their sin so that he could take them as his bride. And when the Father accepted his sacrifice, he raised him from the dead and received him. So that he, showing that he accepted his offering for all of us. If you trust in him for the forgiveness of your sins, then you can come and live in God's house. He will accept you. He accepts all who come by faith to him in Christ, by faith in Christ to him. So Jesus told the disciples of John and the, and the Pharisees that it would be entirely inappropriate for his disciples to fast while the bridegroom was with them. That, it was a time for rejoicing, not fasting. By fasting when the Messiah was among them, the disciples of John and the Pharisees were acting as if he had not come. Can you imagine it? Suppose there was a young woman whose fiancé had been lost at sea and who made it a habit to go out on the shore and to pray for his return each evening with her siblings and her parents and also the, her future in-laws and their, their family. And suppose that that man should return one day and when the evening came and the families began to feast, that the young and celebrate his return, that the young woman's sister and her brother should come to the bridegroom and say, What is this fast? What is this feasting about? It's not time for us to feast. We go out every evening and pray. We go, we fast in the evenings and we go and pray. How are you joining? Now that you've come, they're, they're joining in, in this feasting. And the bridegroom would say, how can they fast and pray for my return when I'm here? <laughs> you got, you got what were you doing when you were going out and fasting? What, 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 were, you, what were you doing? Well, well, we do that every week. Well, we do, or we do that every, every evening. And you, you see, it's just a, a routine that they were going through. Doesn't that speak to us? Doesn't it speak to us about the way that we worship and the way we do our devotions? And the way we sing our songs. We can go right along, cooking away. The motors are all running with, the, with what we're doing. We're busy with worship and all these things. And, and we're not even engaged. Prayers answered, we didn't even notice it. Because we just always pray that. And we keep praying it. As if it hadn't even happened. This exposes something very, very serious about us. Jesus goes on to say in verse 20 that in time that he will be taken away again. And the word suggests taken away forcibly and that then his disciples will fast. But as long as he's with them, he says, how can they fast and pray for my return when I'm here? No, it's not appropriate. So it exposes something about us, about the church. Beware that you're not out of touch with God like this. This is Satan's goal. To make you religious, but dead. If he gets you in that mode, he's got you. He had great success with this ploy over the years. We're not ignorant of his devices. His success is seen right here in our text. With the disciples of the Pharisees and the disciples of John. Some of the disciples of John. Here are religious people fasting and praying, the more devout among all the people. These guys were more devout than the other, other people. And they don't even recognize that God answered their prayers. They just keep right on praying, fasting, like nothing happened. Donald Gray Barnhouse, the minister at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, he was the minister there from 1927 to 1960. And he made this very powerful point about uh, Satan's work. He said, he asked the question, what would Philadelphia look like if Satan entirely took over? And his answer was something like this. If Satan entirely took over Philadelphia, then all the bars in Philadelphia would be closed. All the people, the children would be out in the streets, everything would be safe, everybody would be in their homes, have their little homes and their jobs and They'd all be together in, in harmony and there would be uh, peace and everybody would go to church. Everybody would go to church on Sunday. But the gospel wouldn't be preached. 
And it's interesting when he when he preached that because that's really what was going on in America. People were all going to church. They had their little neighborhoods, and nobody believed the gospel. You know, they they all did their little thing. They helped the old lady cross the street and did the things that good boys do and good girls do and all that stuff. And and they didn't believe the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan loves to have traditionalists that go to church every Sunday and who say their prayers and read their Bible and talk about how God was this or that and don't know the Lord. Maybe they're enthusiasts who are always talking about how the Lord did this or that in their life, or maybe they're traditionalists that just go through the rote motions and don't talk about the Lord, but they're sinners who need a Savior and they're not trusting in the Savior. In both cases, Satan is very pleased because he has kept them from Christ and they feel very good about themselves. That's just what he wants. You need two things to stay in touch with the Lord. First, you need sound doctrine. You need to know who God is from his word, not from your own ideas about what you think is nice or good or whatever. An understanding of what he has done, the creator of the world, the lawgiver, the redeemer, the only savior. You need an understanding that Jesus is the son of God who is equal with the father who came from glory to save us from our sins. And that to save us, he went to the cross and shed his blood because we were that bad. It's not a sweet story about us. It's about how bad we are, not how good we are. And that he's going to come again and judge everyone. And that only those who have righteousness in him will be saved. Those are doctrinal things that you need to know in the word of God. You need to understand the things that are taught in the catechism and the confession. You need to know that whoever believes in him will be saved and whoever doesn't will be lost. You need to be clear about God's person and work. Sound in the faith that was once delivered to the saints. That's the first thing. But that's not all. You can know all that stuff. You can know it all. You can quote it backward and forward. But in order to stay in touch with the Lord, you also need living faith. You need an ongoing awareness of your spiritual health and even of the spiritual health of the church so that your prayers are genuine and not just rote. That you don't just pray for forgiveness because that's the thing you're supposed to pray for. But you pray for forgiveness because you're convicted of your sin and you know that you're under God's wrath and judgment and that you need (coughs) forgiveness. It's very different to say the words and to truly pray. So that you repent and you cry out to God for true deliverance. You can even fast and all that and still pray with your heart far away. You need to be engaged in the spiritual battle that goes on from day to day with the world, the flesh, and the devil. So that you're engaged in the battle against sin and overcoming temptation and Satan and you're fighting and you're looking and fighting for the sake of others and helping them to go on in the ways of the Lord. That there's a real battle that you're engaged in. Not just songs that you sing about it, but that you know it. And you need a consciousness of God's work all around us each day. So that when you eat your food and you say your blessing, that you are actually recognizing that you'd be starving if God hadn't given that to you. They well, out in my cupboard. Where, how did you get it in your cupboard? How did you get the means for it? Where did that, that all the things worked out for you to have that food on your table is because of God. And, and we just say our little blessing. And we didn't even think about that he gave it to us, even though we said it. Responding to his promises as you go on in life. That when you run up against something, Maybe, you, maybe there's sickness or something. You have the promise that God works all things together for good becomes real to you. It becomes something that ministers to you and that you're engaged in. The promise that you will return. You have special seasons of prayer. You know, not just that you say your prayer every day. There are times when you see great need in your life and life of someone else and you've got to go and get on your knees. And you've got to cry out to God about it. 
Because he's real and it's real. And so the word addresses you, so that the word addresses you specifically and personally. That you're reading along and you see something, or you hear the word preached, and you say, I gotta change. I've got to change. And you turn to the Lord and you look to Him. Or you hear something that brings comfort to you. And you respond to the Lord in hope. Jesus puts us back in touch with God by his living presence. So he answered the initial questions as to why the disciples were not fasting. But he doesn't stop with that. He goes on a little deeper. Because he anticipates that this failure to recognize his presence that he was, was here, that this was going to escalate. And that the whole nation of Israel was going to have greater problems when the new covenant came in to replace the old covenant way of approaching God. This very question that was raised by the disciples of John and of the Pharisees anticipates the problem that will come when the fact of the bridegroom's coming changes more than just fasting days. They, they don't get that, that he's here, they don't need to fast for him to come. What are they going to do when there's a whole other way of worship? Jesus explains that with his coming, a whole new order is called for. So much change with his coming. As I showed you, our bridegroom came to make all the arrangements for us to marry him and to be brought into his father's house when he returns for us. He has finished that work of preparing all things that were needed. He paid all of our debts at the cross. We had a whole pile of them. And he knew it when he came, but he came anyway. I mean, he knew it before he came, but he came anyway in order to pay that big pile of debts, to, be, to give himself as a ransom for us. He paid it in full and fulfilled all things as our groom who loves us. All that is required for us to be accepted in our Father's house. This is a huge change before payment and after payment. That's the difference between the old covenant before payment, the new covenant after payment. It's a huge change, and Jesus made all these arrangements, and now you see this is something that changes how we come to God. This is the second thing before we look at how, how our approach to God changed. He also poured out his spirit to prepare us to live with him. This is an ongoing thing, of course, that he's this, the, the work of the Spirit. He does that for each individual that he has come to make up his bride. But John is talking about he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to us to call us into union with him. That's the way Jesus gathers us, the way he gathers the nations. The Spirit comes and the Spirit shows us our need so that we see that we're sinners that need to be saved. And the Spirit shows us that Christ is the Savior and that his sacrifice was acceptable, that he did pay the debt, and we turn to him and look to him for that. It's the Spirit who changes our hearts so that we will come to him, trusting in him as our bridegroom, devoting ourselves to him as those who are yearning to live with him in his Father's house forever. That, that's his work. He graciously draws you by the Holy Spirit. So you see that there is this huge change now from old covenant to new covenant because all things have been arranged. Jesus is going to fill the Father's house with his bride. Come an interesting bride because it's made up of, of many people, but she is one bride and all the individuals that he calls make up that bride. He's going to complete that work. Jesus made all the arrangements. This huge change calls for an entirely new system of worship. The Old Testament system of worship could not continue. It was anticipatory of his coming. It was perfectly suited for to anticipate his coming, to look forward to his coming. It was designed for that. It was about yearning for him to come. It was suited for that time. But now it's about responding to him who has come. Now worship at the temple with the priests and the laws of clean and unclean and all those sacrifices that were done all show that you need to be purified to be in the house of God. You need to be purified. You need to be purified. And they promise. 
that God is going to do the work of purification. But now it's done. So now it's not about looking for that work to be done, but it's about rejoicing in what has been done. We have been purified. There's a new and better priesthood now than that of Aaron. The Aaronic priesthood is gone. And now you have one priest, Jesus Christ, who is exalted to the right hand of God. He makes intercession for us forever. He ever lives to make intercession for us. And we have a different sacrifice. Not all the sacrifices on the altar that were ceremonial, but now he himself is the sacrifice that actually paid the full penalty of our sin. He has offered it and it has been accepted and we have full forgiveness and he lives forever to intercede on that basis. So now we have new sacraments. Circumcision is replaced by baptism in his name, showing that both our guilty record and our wicked heart is cleansed, are cleansed by him. And the Passover is replaced by the Lord's Supper, showing that he himself is the true Passover sacrifice that takes away our sins so that God's judgment does not fall on us but passes over. Above all, our worship is changed from type and shadow to spirit and truth, from promise to fulfillment. See, instead of shadows representing something, we now have the declaration of what was done. That's why preaching is the prominent thing rather than priests in the New Testament. Because we're declaring what has actually truly been done rather than shadowing forth what is going to be done with a whole multitude of ceremonies where we have to keep bathe ourselves and do all these uh, food laws and, and all of these things. And there is a fresh call to love. To love one another as he has loved us and has given himself for us. We now understand love much more fully than we understood it before he came. New commandment I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you. This is a wonderful change. Now that our bridegroom has come, the new covenant, there is more joy. There is more power for living. There is more assurance. And you see how he paid the debt. The Son of God paid the debt. More revelation of God's glory. In Christ crucified, we see the love of God, the justice of God, the wisdom of God, the holiness of God, the wrath of God, the power of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God. All of these are revealed to us in a much fuller way than before he came. The new worship is also easier to spread to the nations because it's not confined to a particular place. Not in Jerusalem anymore will you worship me, Jesus said, but now uh, you will worship me in spirit and in truth. It's not about sacrifices to the temple. It's about a, proclama a worldwide proclamation of the finished work of Jesus Christ, the good news that sinners have a salvation through him. Yet Jesus knew, even though it was so much better, he knew that it would be very difficult to accept this new covenant worship for the Jews to accept it. He knew that people would find it hard as the disciples, even the disciples of the Pharisees and, the, and John did, to fully come to grips with the fact that he had come and done all. Jesus warned the Jews that they must embrace these changes of worship under the new covenant or they would come to ruin. It tells us that through the two parables here. You couldn't call them parables or parabolic type things. But first, by the parable of the old cloth, he shows that he didn't come just to patch up the old. He wasn't a patch for all the things that had gone wrong in the old covenant. He says, verse 21, no one sews a piece of untrunk cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the terror is made worse. The cloth they used, you see, would shrink. So everyone knew that if you had a hole in a garment and you got a piece of new cloth and you put it on, what happens as soon as it gets wet? The new cloth shrinks and then it pulls out where it's stitched in, it pulls out an even bigger hole than you had to start with. And so it doesn't work to take new cloth and put it on an old garment. By this, Jesus is showing that you can't take him and use him to patch up Judaism or anything else. 
those who try to do that will end up with a ruined garment. They want to hold on to something that doesn't fit with Jesus Christ. The old covenant is not suitable now that Christ has come. The second parable is very similar. It's the parable of the wineskins. It shows that Jesus cannot be contained in the old order. Verse 22. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine bursts the wineskins and the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. But new wine must be put into new wineskins. So the way this worked was you had these, uh, they were actually made of animal skins, sometimes goat skins, things like that. They would have a, a kind of a bladder, kind of a bag that they would use and, uh, with the skins, and then they would put their wine in there to carry it. And when it was a fresh skin, and it was just elastic, and it could, as the wine uh, went through processes, and it would, it would uh, expand, and the skin would be fine. You would just stretch a bit with it. But if you had a really old skin and been stretched a bunch of times, you know, rubber bands get after a while, you just go, and you just break. Well, it won't stretch anymore, so you put a new wine in, it swells up. The wine is lost, the skin is lost. That's what he's talking about. Jesus, our bridegroom, must have his own worship. The worship of the New Testament, not of the old or any other worship that man might divide, devise. It's worship that is appointed for him, the unique Son of God who came here and accomplished the work that he has accomplished on the cross. Accepting the new covenant has become and has been a constant struggle for the church. We always think, seem to think that the new covenant worship needs to be blended with something else. Our own philosophy, our own way of worship, something else. It was a problem for the Jews who had had their Old Testament worship since Moses. Even before Jesus went to the cross, our text shows with these Pharisees and these disciples of John <coughs> mindlessly clinging to their, own, their old way. We always fast on the second and fifth day. We've been doing this, for, in this case, for a couple of hundred years, yearning for the Messiah to come. Even before that, even in the exile during the 70 years, they had all this fast. They, they, were, they were praying like this and not recognizing that, hey, you don't need to fast for that anymore. <coughs> Jesus has, has come. They were clinging to the old, kept them from seeing what God has done. That's what happens when people have traditions. They just go through it and they don't see what God is doing. What he's done, it's all just kind of on autopilot. You see, this is just a small foretaste of what we see here with them, of the immense proportions to which this problem is going to grow very, very rapidly. And Jesus is anticipating that when he tells us these two parables. It is the great controversy of the early church during the time of the apostles. Is it not that the, the old covenant worship, they are trying to cling to it. Those that could not fully accept that our bridegroom had done all wanted to hang on to the old system of sacrifices and circumcision and food laws. It was not appropriate because Jesus had come. A system that anticipated him was not appropriate. Fasting for him to come, so to speak, was not the thing to do now. Those who tried to use Jesus to patch up old things under the old covenant system found that the old cloth, the new cloth, tore loose from the old cloth that it was trying to patch. The new wine could not be contained without bursting the wineskins. So it is to this day with the Messianic Jewish movement. You run into that. Those groups, they, they don't last from age to age. They, they rise up over here, they rise up over there. And they don't last because they're trying to retain all the old system and put Jesus on as a patch to fix the thing up. He's not a patch. There's a whole new system demanded and called for when Christ comes into the world. He deserves the honor of a new way of worship as the one who has finished the work that he was given to do. Then, all through the ages of church history, the problem continues as efforts have been made over and over again to synthesize new covenant worship with the prevailing ideas of whatever society, whatever day. 
When the gospel reached the Greeks, there was this tendency to try to patch up Greek religion and philosophy, to contain the new faith in the ideas of the Greek uh, philosophy. The result was heresies that denied the unique nature of Christ as fully God and fully man. Those arose in the East and not in the West, reducing him to be a no real savior at all and leaving worshipers to make their own way of salvation. You had the, old, the whole Arian uh, error where they said Jesus was less than God. He's less than God, then you've got to do your own salvation. If you don't have God to save you, I guess it's left up to you. And that's the, that was the problem you see. Of the, when the, because the philosophy, the Greek philosophy, wouldn't allow there to be one who is all God and all man, 100% God, 100% man. It, it, it wouldn't work for their system. So it tore away. It, didn't, it couldn't be contained. And then there were those along the way who tried to fit him in to the pagan modes of worship, where he does not belong. The pagans found it hard to give up prayers to their ancestors. And they found it hard to give up prayers to a multiplicity of gods for different things that they needed. And so those who tried to work these systems together said, hey, we can have prayer to the ancestors of the church, so to speak. We can pray to to Mary and to to the different great saints that have lived before us, and then people will feel more comfortable in coming to God, and we we can call on them for different things that we need. We can ask this one to protect us and that one to do this. And so this melding together with paganism and the new covenant was was a huge problem. And so what happened? Well, Well, soon... Uh, the, the soon preachers that belonged to the new covenant order were replaced with priests with big robes and big hats, burning incense, offering sacrifices, because that's what the pagans were used to. And because now it was dependent on some man offering a sacrifice for me rather than on what Jesus did. Now, now it's 2,000 years ago. You know, it wasn't that long ago whenever they lived. But what Jesus did on the cross when he came. So you see, again, the, the new wine could not be contained in those old pagan systems of worship, those old Greek systems of worship. The result is that now instead of finding salvation in the finished work of Christ, salvation is found in man. You see? Priests, saints, ceremonies... Lighting candles. That's not how salvation is found. And in more recent times, you have those who try to fit Christ into modern philosophy. Things like rationalism that denies the supernatural. So we're going to have a nice little religion that doesn't acknowledge the supernatural, that God created everything and such things. But we're going to connect with God in a more spiritual way than that. And... uh, and moralism that denies the inheritance, inherent sin of all men. That's a very popular one today, isn't it? We come to church and be good people and we be good in our community and we do lots of good things. Again, Christ is set aside. You can't mix him with that. Or to the psychological view that man needs most of all to have his self-esteem boosted. And that Jesus is the minister of self-esteem. He comes and tells you that you are such a good person and that you are so precious and loved and all of these things. I mean, you can say in a way he does tell us that and we're his people. But the focus is that he tells you that, not not telling you that you're a sinner, but he tells you that you're so good. And that he's and and not that you need to be delivered from hell. And there is the attempt to fit Christ into a self-indulgent lifestyle like that of the world. That's a very popular one too. That your life is all about fulfilling your pleasures and your desires and all that stuff about deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me, that, that's irrelevant. <laughs> like it's all about you and you being fulfilled. That's another modern gospel. There's just all this, there's all of this stuff. You see, Christ cannot repair these broken philosophies. You can't bring him and stick him into these things to clean them up somehow, nor can these philosophies contain him. He will not be contained. He is the Lord. 
The new cloth will tear them and the new wine will burst them. The church needs to see today what it has always needed to see. The church needs to see that Christ, the bridegroom, has come and that everything must now be subservient to him as Lord and Master, as the one who has come for the purpose of taking his bride to himself. Everything is subservient to him. Under the new covenant worship, the, understand that the new covenant worship remains until he comes. You know what some people do with the text we're looking at today? About the new wine and uh, the, all of that. Some people actually try to use today's text to teach the very thing I'm telling you it doesn't teach. Okay, that we need to do something new for every generation. That's how people use it. In most extreme cases, you have churches that have separate worship services for different generations. They teach that we must break out of the old mold and embrace new ways for each generation. That's actually the very opposite of what Jesus is doing. That's what we have been doing in the church all these years, trying to adapt Christ to us. What is taught here is not change because the people have changed. Jesus didn't say we need a new system here of worship because the people have changed a lot. That's not the issue. No, we need to change because Christ has come. The change is about Him and what He has done, not about us and how we feel or how we think. Everything was changed by God through the apostles to fit in with the reality that Christ came among us as our bridegroom. It's not, it's not about fitting Him to us. It doesn't work. But us to Him. That's why we die. And come to him. We're crucified with Christ. And then we live with him. We are to stick to the traditions of the apostles until Jesus returns. Now, of course, for many Christians that have been swept up into stuffy old church traditions and stuffy old church ceremonies that were never appointed by the apostles, they do need to break away from the old and to embrace the not more human innovations which is what they often do. we got to get away from all this old stuffy stuff. we got to have something new. And then they go to more human innovations. They're coming away from human innovation to go to more human innovation. But they need to embrace the New Testament worship of the apostles. We must reckon with the fact that Christ has come and that our worship is centered around Him, not around church traditions or around novel innovations of people's preferences and desires. But that's not all that we need to be sure of here something else that we've seen today as well. And this kind of goes back to what we were looking at before. Just to bring you back around. We must see to it that we never ever content ourselves with just keeping the right outward forms. I mean the tradition of the apostles. The New Testament worship that has been appointed. We never content ourselves. We must never do that with just we're following the form. True worship demands living faith that responds to our bridegroom who truly came among us, who truly made arrangements for us to live in his father's house, who is truly alive today at the right hand of the father, who truly sent his living spirit to inhabit our hearts, who is coming personally to receive us as our bridegroom. Until he comes, we have communion with him by the Holy Spirit. This is more personal than ever before, even when he walked on the earth. Because he is with us all the time as our gracious, risen, holy Savior and Lord. You are to live in communion with him. Again, that means when you sin, you should be convicted and broken personally before him. So that you repent and confess your sin, looking to him for forgiveness. And you should be constantly learning of him of his person, of his work, of the things that he has done for us, taking joy in deeper and fuller comprehension of his love and of his grace. And you should be learning and increasingly doing what pleases him, loving him, loving others, keeping his commandments, yearning to to grow, to put off the old man, to put on the new man. Christ is present with us as our bridegroom. That means that you take up his way And you continually walk in a living way in his way and not in a dead way in his way. If you are just going through the motions, 
or if your walk is a walk that doesn't connect with him in a living way, like the disciples of John and the Pharisees, then you're in desperate need of change. Now I'm going to give you some counsel here about where to start. You're just going through the motions, and you're not really living in that way that I was just talking about, where you're responding to God in, th- in your life. Start right there. Start with that very problem. Come to the Lord about that problem because it's a huge problem and you need to cry out to Him. Real crying. Be deeply concerned and look to Him for mercy and grace. Tell Jesus that you know that He's the bridegroom who came to save and that you're coming to Him to change you, to work in you, that He is the one who calls us to a fuller fellowship and that you're looking to Him to produce that in you. That you don't want to be like the disciples of John who are fasting and did not even notice that the Lord had answered their prayers. Tell him that you want to be one who rejoices when rejoices is in order and one who fasts and weeps when fasting and weeping is in order. He is gracious and he will hear you and you will live. Please stand. Heavenly Father, how can we praise you sufficiently for all that you have done? We cannot praise you sufficiently. But Father, we do praise and magnify your great name. You are exalted over all as our Redeemer and our Lord and our Savior. We praise you that you did indeed send our Lord Jesus Christ and that he actually did come among us and that his presence here changed everything. That before that, the bride, before the bridegroom came, the church did not yet have arrangements made to be able to live in our Father's house, in your house. But after he came, all things were accomplished. And now we have the assurance of his finished work. We have a gospel, good news to proclaim, of a kingdom established, a household kingdom where we will live forever and ever. We praise you, Lord. What a, what a privilege, what a tremendous privilege it is to be heirs of the kingdom of God, to be the bride of Jesus Christ, to be destined to live in that house where you are our father and where he is our husband. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would help us, Lord, to live in the light of that, that we would not seek to conform you to us, but that we would be conformed to you. You are the husband, you are the Lord, and we are the bride. And we come to you, O Lord, to live before you. We know that we will find the fullness of life as we die in order that we might live. That we will even find our individuality as we die in order that we might live to you. Father, truly, we really come alive when we come to you in faith. We pray, O Lord, then that you would help us, Lord, and that you would guide us from day to day. We pray that we would have a true responsive relationship to you and not a relationship that is just pent up with doing the forms. We pray, Father, that we would worship you in the way that you have appointed, and that way that you have appointed is not only the structure that you appointed and the ordinances that you appointed, but it is also the spirit that you call for in us. And we pray, Father, that that spirit would be there, that it wouldn't be devoid, so that we find ourselves praying for things and don't even notice when the prayer is answered. Father, please bless your people, Lord, and help us, Lord, to have a a living, true relationship with you as our God. Father, thank you so much for all the things that you've revealed to us in Christ and all the things that you've done in him. It is in his name we pray. Amen.